not. No, this is going to be a this is going to be a heck of a day. Um, the reason we can sit up here and talk is because Jesus gave my daughter a new dad, not the old dad that she had before all the addiction. You heard the story of my my testimony. You heard my wife's story of what she had to witness. And now you're going to hear the story of our daughter who went through it. So, Michaela, if you want to come up here. Someone may have to force her up here. Isn't she beautiful? I'm so glad that she looks like her mother. Oh, thank, praise God for that. Um, does she... What are we watching here? Oh, the most grocery bags carried in one trip. Thank you. Yes. Did you do this? You, you guys playing this? Yeah. Dad jokes, yep. Overall goofiness, yep. The, okay. This is... This is getting me before I, I uh, even start. I did teach her how to drive, uh, not well though. Uh, mom had to mom had to take over after, and I think she still holds the uh, the habits that I have, and not what Crystal has. Because last night, I had all three girls in my house tell me how much of a terrible driver I was, which was great because we drove like eight blocks. But anyways. Um, I, I just, I love having her here. There's this beauty about her. And I want you to know that she is single because the only man she's able to date is Jesus. Or she's not able to date until Jesus comes back. But in all seriousness, what, what Michaela, what were the two rules I gave you at about age 11 about dating? Um, he has to love. All the way up to, yeah, there you go. He has to love Jesus, and he can't be a 49ers fan. <laughs> you got you to gotta love Jesus, can't be a 49ers fan. Now, I'm opening that up to other teams because I figure that she can date a Cowboys fan because she'll never get a ring. So, um, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to let that one sit for a minute. Some of you are now just getting what I just said, which is cool. I think I was 15 the last time I saw a ring on um, a Cowboys player's finger, but that, that was, that's besides the point. Go Hawks, right? Anyways, um, Michaela, thank you for being up here. I know it's difficult. Uh, I, I need to get this out in the open. She wanted me to let you know that uh, when things are serious, she has this tendency to laugh. So if, if it's a super serious moment where we go to her and tell her something has happened, she bursts out laughing. And it's just a uh, coping me mechanism. There were a lot of times this week as we talked about the story of, of her childhood and growing up that there were, there were moments that she remembered that I didn't until she brought it up. And there were moments where I would talk about things and she didn't remember until I brought it up. And I want you to know something about the human mind. We're getting into psychology here, but the human mind is wired for safety and protection and being comfortable. And when you step outside of that comfort zone, that's when you grow. So when we were talking and we were growing closer together through this talk, it was incredibly painful to get out of that comfort zone and we had to take multiple breaks where we would t start talking about what led up to the moment we have now and we would look at each other and say, we need to stop, let's go out and let's go to the ocean for a little bit. And then we, we would revisit it. 
Michaela, for those who are new here and don't know what I'm talking about, because I just realized there's a lot of new faces, um, for a large majority of my daughter's childhood, she had a father who was an addict, an alcoholic, a felon, um, was in jail, tried taking his life, and um, ultimately Jesus saved. And so that's, that's the, uh, the baseline of where we're going, but they, they didn't come here for me. They came here for you, but Michaela, I, uh, I want, just tell us, tell us a little about yourself now, now. Okay. I'm Michaela, I'm 22, I almost said 21, but um, I am a dental assistant in Lincoln, California, and I work at the children's ministry at my church in Lincoln. So she asked me a question this week. She said, Dad, how honest do you want me to be? And the reason she asked that question was because she said, I don't want to hurt your feelings. And I looked at her and I said, I want you to be as real as it was because that's how Jesus is glorified in the midst of it. So there are gonna be some hard moments today, some moments where I had to get away and realize that not only did I do this to somebody else, but I did it to my, my only girl. And the enemy tried to shame me into silence. But I realized that verse, a new creation, that the old is dead and gone, that we can now bring glory to God by talking through this story. But um, can we bring up that first picture? We had Michaela at a young age. And that, that's, that's my little girl right there. Look at that hair on that guy though, man. I, I don't know about the look you're giving. Uh, that, that look is something else. But uh, this was the moment where things were smooth in our life. I, I absolutely adored having this little girl that I could hold in my arms. But Michaela, can you tell us about the, uh, the good moments that you remember before everything came into play? Yes, um, so I wrote here, I don't really have a lot of good memories at that time, but I do remember going to the park, taking me to work with you when you were sober. That yeah. was the good times. Um, just hanging out and yeah. Playing. Um, she was with me wherever we went. She was my little sidekick, my little buddy. Um, at, at three years old, some things started changing. And what did you notice when things got bad? Um, mood swings were horrible. I do remember one time um, we were at the house and we were just sitting there watching TV and then he looks at me and he's like, <laughs> he says, go brush your teeth. And mom asked you like five times and then me and my mom like looked at each other and we had no idea what he was talking about because he never said that or she never said that. Um, he wouldn't get off the couch some days. You weren't there when I learned how to ride a bike. Um. I, was, I was there, but I didn't have the, if you've ever been in addiction, if you don't have that pill, that drug, that alcohol, that bottle, you don't wanna do anything. And so I was laying on the couch while my wife taught Michaela how to ride a bike, and I missed that moment. Um, <clears throat> you continue to take me to work with you, but it was also other places. I wasn't allowed to tell mom at the time, and I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, I saw inside of the ER every day So for um, six years, Michaela spent more time in an ER than most people will in their lifetime because 
And there's moments where today you may say, Matt, you're talking a lot. Well, she has asked me to speak on certain subjects. There were moments where it was every single day where Crystal would go to work and I would grab Michaela and we would go to an ER and I would tell them that my back hurt so I could get painkillers. And I, I used Michaela as a sympathy tool for the doctor. And there were times where she would wake up and mom would leave and she would say, dad, I don't want to go into the hills. And you remember those moments. What were the hills? Um, we had to travel over some hills to go to um, new hospitals for him to be able to get more pills so they didn't know him there. So we would drive long distances to get to hospital rooms and we tried to time it out so that we'd, we would be home in time for mom to be home. And I would always look at her and say, now what are we going to tell mom today? And she would recite, we played all day. We had fun together, but I taught her at a young age not to tell the truth to her mom. And uh, let's go to the second picture. This was her age when I started my addiction. A little little girl am I am I cut off Did you cut me off can you guys hear me okay okay I'm a little low but um, are we sitting too close together no okay so Michaela grew up from the age of three until nine in this phase of hospitals um, when she when she just mentioned we would go to new places new places for her were drug houses. So she would be in her car seat while I would be doing a drug deal with somebody else. And um, then came a point in the addiction where she was sitting in the back of a car and I get a phone call. And it was loud enough where she could hear in the back. But will you tell us a little bit about what that phone call was? Yes, I don't really remember how old I was, um, but I was sitting in the back seat, and we were on your paper routes. <laughs> yeah, I was 20, 26 with a paper route. Why wouldn't you? But. Um, and my mom calls him, and I hear my mom over the phone um, say, stay where you are. We're coming to pick you up, and you're going to jail. And... I started to cry because I heard that and then he got off the phone and he calmly looked at me and he said, I'm just going on a fishing trip. I'll be back. And then um, the cop came and he um, didn't arrest him in front of me, which I am forever grateful for. Yeah. So he actually <laughs> took me around the corner because this detective that we, I, I love him to this day. We've been able to reconcile and I, we've actually been able to go back and thank him for what he did. But he was so caring for my wife and my daughter that he allowed Crystal to come and be with Michaela in the car while he walked me around the corner to put me in handcuffs so that she didn't have to have a memory of seeing her dad in handcuffs. But um, you realized when mom was folding the blanket, do you want to talk about that? Because she told you, I, and I told you, I was just going on a fishing trip and that I would be back sometime. Yeah, so we were in the car and he was persistent on telling me that it was a fishing trip and I was telling him that I heard everything. Um, but I feel like I was kind of young, so you were like, no, you didn't. <laughs> kind yeah. of thing, but we went to our house after, and um, I walked out of my room, and my mom was folding our famous King's blanket that we always had. Sacramento Kings. Yeah. And um, I looked at her, and I said, Dad's not going on the fishing trip. 
um, can you please tell me the truth? And then that's when she told me that he went to jail. So talk about the, the, uh, the memories that you have of your dad in jail <clears throat> and you having to come visit. Um, I don't really have, I feel like that's where it blocked a lot of it out. Um, but I do remember talking to you through the glass, putting my hand up there. Um, and I remember one time I, we left and I did like a little heart with my hands and then I like let go and like forever he thought I was doing like a broken heart, but I wasn't. <laughs> my heart was broken. Um, so for three months, I, I had to see this little girl through three inches of glass and she couldn't understand why she couldn't touch her dad. She couldn't understand why she had to pick up a phone to be able to hear her dad's voice. And this is where the strength of my wife comes in, of being able to walk Michaela through that <clears throat> darkness. And finally, by the grace of God, I was released out of jail and things were going well. Can I say something? Uh, you can say, well, this is your day. You can say whatever you want. Um, I just want to say that um, while my dad was in jail, I never once heard my mom talk anything bad about him towards me. It was hard for her because um, obviously she didn't want to take me there. But every day she would take me. Can't look over there. Don't look no. over there. <laughs> it's going to be a three-hour sermon if I keep <laughs> doing this. Um, then I got out of jail. I was actually in jail, and I, I, was, I was clean. I was sober. I got out of jail, and I got a, I got a job. And things were going well for, uh, for about eight months. I got a really good job. I was able to support the family. Um, I got into HVAC, which was wild to me because I didn't even know what a screwdriver was at the time, and I got, it, which is a funny story. My, parent, my parents got me a tool set for Christmas, and I opened it up, and my wife looked at me, and she said, what are you going to do with that? You couldn't even name one of these, and I'm like, there, there's some turny thingies in here. <laughs> But I get, a, I get a job and things are going smooth. I'm starting to repair the relationship that I have with my wife. I'm starting to repair the relationship that I have with my daughter. But then I relapsed eight months in and it was all because of boredom. If you're struggling with an addiction right now, I want to implore you. I'm going to take a time out and pause. Can I implore you to get to reach out and get some help? Because all it took for me to go back into that addiction was one day I woke up and said, you know what? I don't want to go to work today. I want to hang out with my daughter. And I was bored, not by hanging out with her. That's, that was a bad segue, but um, I was bored. That's all it took was I was bored. And I called my drug dealer back and said, I know you haven't heard from me for a long time, but hey, can I just have a couple? And that turned into us this full-blown addiction again and us running and moving to California. The addiction was so wild and so crazy in California. It, it was when I had six overdoses. One of them was with Michaela in the car. And that's, that's a point where she doesn't, the trauma, trauma will protect your brain. And sometimes it'll erase the memories unless you dig really deep to, to uncover it, to find healing from it. But there was one time that we were in the air, airport waiting for Crystal to come off of the airline. And I overdosed in the car with my daughter in her booster seat. And luckily my wife found us before anyone else did and she saved my life multiple times. But. As the addiction got worse, so did the mood swings, so did uh, the, uh, you started losing the dad that, that you thought you had. But tell me about the night that you wanted me gone. 
Um, I don't remember a lot of it, but I do remember that you and mom were fighting really bad. And I think she wanted you out of the house. I can't remember. Um, but you hit, you punched a hole through the bathroom door. And I was in my room, and I remember just walking out to you, and you were laying on the couch because you were just, I don't even, I don't know how to describe it, but you were laying there just like, you know, relaxed. And I said, um, I hate you, and I want you to leave. So it was a, a surreal moment for me of a seven-year-old girl coming to me and turning my face as calm as can be and saying those words, Dad, I hate you. I want you to leave. It wasn't out of anger. It wasn't out of spite. That was her true feelings that went through that. So I ended up leaving for the night. But then came a point where the addiction was so strong and so severe that I decided that it was time for me to leave this earth. And my, my wife took my daughter to grandma's house and I knew July 20th, 2009, that would be the day that I would take my life. And I called Crystal at 5 p.m. and I had a time set for 5.45 that I would, I would be in the garage and I would remove myself from this world. You've heard it before, but this Bible here that I preach out of has my suicide note that I wrote in, in it for my wife and for my daughter. And um, I, I know that this part is hard for you. It's extremely hard for me as well, but tell me what you remember about July 20th, 2009. This is an eight-year-old girl. And uh, the reason why I say through the eyes of a child is adults can tend to hide things because they don't want the, the, the bad side shown. But this is reality of what she saw that day. Um, so I remember uh, my mom grabbing me from the house and From we, Grandma's house? No, our uh, house. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll let you talk. I'll just be here. <laughs> um, and she said that we're going to Grandma's, and I loved going to Grandma's, so I was super excited. And that's another thing is my mom never let me know that they were ever fighting unless I heard it. Um, so we went to grandma's, I thought everything was fine. We got there, um, we started making cookies. And then all of a sudden, um, my mom was like, we need to leave. Um, and so she grabbed me and I was all upset. I was like, I wanna make cookies, I'm not leaving. And then um, we get there and the garage opens and I remember mom um, running out and then I got out and I just saw my dad crying on the floor of the garage. That's all I remember. So you don't know why I was laying on the, the garage floor and the reason why Crystal was running is because she literally saved my life as I was stepping off of a chair. And um, all she saw was her dad laying on the garage floor crying and then I then I the next day I was gone again wasn't I because I went into a rehab center the very next day mm -hmm. tell me what your memories are of those three months that I now had to be away I wasn't fishing I wasn't behind a pane of glass but I was away from them for three months while I got help um, I remember it being hard um, because at first, when you went away, you told me the truth. You told me where you were going. And I was like, okay. And you were like, I'll only be gone for one month. That's what you said. And I was like, okay. And then I was, we couldn't see him throughout the week. It was only the weekends. Um, and then I think it was either the last week or the week before the last week, you said, I will be here for another three months. And all I remember, because I didn't understand, I was so mad. I was like, so the reason why we told her one month is because that's all I had planned. And in my mind, I was like, I'm just gonna do the 30 days and I'll be fine, everything will be back to normal. While I was in the center, rehab center, and the 30 days started approaching, I called my wife and I said, I'm not strong enough to come home. I'm not strong enough to face the reality of, of what has happened. I don't think I'm well enough. 
I don't think that this addiction has, has actually gone away from me. I need to do another month. And that month turned into three months where I finally came home. <clears throat> and uh, that center changed my life because that's where I met Jesus and I met the ultimate forgiveness. And I, met, I, I read that verse and I realized that if God could do it for somebody else, then God could do it for me. And that I could be a new creation walking out of those doors and I could go home into this, this family unit with Jesus with me and realize that Jesus can put us back together, whether we were together physically or not, because she still had divorce papers on the table. Michaela knew nothing about the divorce papers. But whether we are together or not, I knew that if I continued to walk with Jesus, that all his plans were for good. And then we, uh, we went to, and I'm crying more than you are. This is <laughs> stupid. We went to lunch when you were 11 years old. And by that time, I had I started helping out with uh, youth ministry. God was repairing our marriage. God was repairing our family. And we went to a Mexican restaurant for lunch. And my wife got up and went to the bathroom. And Michaela looked at me. And can you tell them what you said to me? No. You want me to tell them? Michaela looked at me at 11 years old and she said, Dad, I have to ask you a question. And I said, sure, baby, go ahead. And she said, do you remember the time where I told you that I hated you and I wanted you to leave? And I said, yeah, that's in my brain. Yes, I remember that. And she looked at me, the voice of an 11 year old, and she said, Dad, I need to ask for your forgiveness. And I said, what? Do you realize what I put you through? For six years, what I put you through. And you're sitting here asking for my forgiveness. But now this is where you have to talk. Why, why did you feel the need to ask for my forgiveness? Um, at the time, I didn't really understand. It was just like a feeling that came over me. Um, <laughs> um, I just, I guess I, I, I chalked it up to be that I wanted our relationship back to normal. Um, now I look back on it, and I believe it was because Jesus wanted forgiveness to flow through our family, and I think he wanted it to start with me. So I hope you caught that. At 11 years old, she knew she wanted forgiveness to flow through our family. And even at 11, she, she had this realization that forgiveness has to start with me, which how strong the Holy Spirit is even in a child. So I want, I want everyone here another pause in the sermon I don't care how young you are I want you to be able to be heard and parents I want you to listen if the Holy Spirit is talking through your child to tell you something so powerful I want you to be able to hear those words that the Holy Spirit has for you so she had asked for forgiveness I of course said, no, I need, I need you to forgive me for everything that I've done. And she said, Dad, I've already forgiven you. I've already forgiven you. And we go four years of walking in the forgiveness of Jesus till she was 13 years old. I was a youth pastor. She was in our youth group. Our youth group grew from three people to over 100 kids that we were we were pastoring in our home. We finally had to leave our home and have a youth center because we had so many kids coming into our house. So much Little Caesars pizza. <laughs> right. And youth pastors out there, the $5 pizzas, 
you can feed an army of kids with that, but I am so tired of Little, <laughs> little Caesar's Pizza. By the way, they're not a sponsor of today's sermon, so I can say that. <laughs> but um, and then I took you on a drive. I took you on a drive, and what did I, what did I tell you? Um, you looked at me. Sorry. You looked at me, and you said that you relapsed, and that you were going to get help again, and I did not believe you. So when I told you that I had relapsed as a, as a youth pastor, <laughs> your youth pastor, what were your feelings in that car ride that moment? Um, I mainly felt very betrayed um, because recently I think when before that was happening it was when you were sober and we were having a good time and you finally let me know um, who was supplying you the drugs so, um, so you can let the audience know who was supplying it was uh, my mom's dad and then it was my great grandpa um, when we moved to California so I felt very betrayed because the three closest men in my life um, caused yeah. this. Yeah. So I uh, did relapse 2013, got some help, went back into that same arena. But what, what changed in the way you dealt with 2009 to 2013? Yeah. We'll get we'll get through this one, <laughs> but what what was the strength behind that 2013 relapse? And we can bring up picture three, please. Um. Um. It was Pastor Tim. <sighs> Sorry. <clears throat> he took me aside, and said. Jesus is stronger than this addiction. Um, please do not give up on him. He needs you more than ever. So this guy right here who passed away last year took Michaela in and she said, I know that your dad did this but Jesus is stronger than what your dad is going through. And the whole don't give up on him, he also said that to me. And, and so much grace flowed from that. But how, as a 13-year-old, as a I can't wrap my brain around this, but how as a 13-year-old were you able to keep walking with Jesus throughout this time? Honestly, at first, I didn't. I didn't think that, sorry, <laughs> I didn't think that he was, I was like someone would never do this to someone so young, um, the, all the hurt, I didn't think that he was there, I was like, there's no way, <laughs> no way he would put someone through this again, uh, but... It was if it if it wasn't for Pastor Tim, I don't think that I would have um, like kept believing in him and following him. So the uh, the what well, you told me this week, and I know you're having a hard time with this moment, is you said the strength of Pastor Tim and the strength of your mom allowed you to continue walking towards Jesus and with Jesus, but. Um, yeah, well, sorry, I'm going to say something. No, you <laughs> um, Just the strength of my mom, because I looked at it as she has a choice to be with you. Um, I don't. <laughs> You're stuck with me. <laughs> so, um, and she believed in you, and never once did I ever hear anything bad about you come out of her mouth towards, to me, to make me hate you. And so... I was like, if she can do it, I can do it. <laughs> so I can't even look over here, but the uh, wouldn't, 
Would you want to say something bad about somebody that has put your family through hell and back and then back into hell? Wouldn't you want to do that? But she realized that there's no healing and no strength in those negative thinking, the, that way of negative thoughts, of negative speaking. And not once did she insult me, tear me down, or belittle me in front of Michaela, or even really to me, it was always just this quiet strength that she had of saying, Jesus is bigger than this. That's why I call her my Batman. She is, she is <laughs> everything it was always to this the, family. It was always the death stare, too. She, was, she didn't have to say anything. <laughs> she, <laughs> she, just had, she just looked at you. <laughs> if, you, haven't gotten the Chris, if, you <laughs> if you haven't gotten the crystal death stare, you, you, just be you, grateful. You're lucky. You're lucky. She can have one look, and I'm just like, I did something wrong, but I have no idea what, so I'm just going to freeze right here yeah. in this moment. And, and she'll let me know what I did. But <laughs> as we wrap this up, I know that um, uncovering this was hard on you. I know it was hard on your mom. I know it's hard on me. But um, there's a question that I have to ask you that, that I want you guys to hear who are going through wounds from family members or wounds from friends, but this question is so important. How were you able to forgive me? I have to pick up my phone for this one because it's a little bit of a long one, but um, it took me a very long time um, like I said before, I never hated you to the point where I can remember the time that I was like, okay, I forgive you. Because there was always like that soft spot that I was like, he's going to change. Um, I did, it did definitely take me a very long time to trust you again. And there wasn't really one moment, it wasn't one day that I thought, oh, I'm going to forgive him today. Um, it was an everyday walk with Jesus where I would keep bringing the pain, her anger, and disappointment to God. And then I finally realized that he had taken it from me. He took it from the beginning, but I didn't know it. Um, it was just a realization of this verse. Can we get that second verse up on the screen? Do you want to read that? Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So it was a realization of that yeah. verse. Mm -hmm. And before you go into that verse, I want you guys to know that I read this verse and I, sh I say, yes, they did know what they were doing. Right? They knew where to put the nails. They knew where to put the crown of thorns. They knew the amount of torture they could put Jesus through. But they didn't, un what he was saying is they didn't understand the eternal implications of what they were doing at that time. They, it was outside of their control. And you can go into what we talked about of the addiction portion of it. Um, I think there was a time that I finally understood and grasped that addiction is a sickness. It's not a choice. It is a choice to take it, obviously, <laughs> but it's a sickness, and you can only, if you want to get better, it's your choice. No one can force you into that, and that's, and that's where I think that's when you found Jesus in rehab. He helped you with that decision, um, and then, um, and since I've been forgiven by so much, Jesus gave me the power to forgive you. That'll preach right there, church. 13-year-old yeah. saying that she realized that she had been forgiven for so much, so then now she has the power to forgive her father. I need you all to know how much you've been forgiven from. Because if you don't know how much you've been forgiven from, you'll never walk in the forgiveness, full forgiveness that Jesus has offered you. Just by saying yes, the, the Bible verse says that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. 
that, we, that he took everything from us. And when she says that it was a sickness, for me it was a sickness. And my wife is one of the only people who knows this, but I would go to bed at night praying that God would take away my, my compulsion for the drug and the alcohol. And then in the morning I would wake up and I would choose to walk out that door with Michaela and go find more. And I realized that when I came to Jesus and he made me a new creation, that compulsion was completely removed from my life. That it was gone. It was, it was literally taken from me. So we're able, as a family, where someone in front of me can have a glass of wine and there's no urge, there's no compulsion. So there's another verse that you brought up and we'll bring this third verse. This is so powerful, church. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. But I need to ask you this as not only a pastor, but as your dad. But what does, when it talks about Jesus, and I'm a, I'm a Jesus guy, you know that. Really? What? <laughs> What does Jesus mean to you? Um, he, it's just, sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> all in all, it's just forgiveness. It's grace over and over and over again. Um, and he always, always is there. It's always there. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what did Jesus do for you? We, we did talk about this. Do you want me to? Yes, please. About I think I don't think I have. About giving your dad back. Yes. You can go into that a little bit. Just giving him back. I I lost all hope in him. I finally at one point came to the terms that he was just never going to be a dad I could rely on, um, and that me and my mom had to be there for him more than he could be there for us. But Jesus saved your life, and I think that he saved ours by saving your life. Please go ahead. Okay. I'm just giving hand signals. Oh. Um, he saved your life, and I think that saved ours because I wanted nothing but a relationship with you, and I feel that that's why I was constantly forgiving you is because I, no matter how much hurt there was, I never wanted to have a life without you and, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Same. <laughs> Same. Um, obviously, Jesus is the only reason why we sit up here today. Jesus is the only name we praise. Um, there is no building Matt up, building Crystal up, building Michaela up that can compare to the name of Jesus. Because once Jesus entered our family's life, this is what came of it. Through all the addiction, all the pain, the, the, the overdoses, the suicide, the the uh, divorce papers, all of that. It was me trying to get better for them and it always would fail, wouldn't it? I would always let you know, I'm gonna get better for you. I'm gonna get better for you, but that didn't work. And you told me something so poignant yesterday. I'll, I'll talk for you again. Sorry. Um, she said, you can't do it for somebody else. You can't get well for somebody else. That can only last a little bit of time. You have to allow Jesus to enter the picture and come and transform you completely where you focus only on you and Jesus. And, and all of a sudden, everything around you is starting to, to mend where the broken hearts are being repaired, where there's a brand new creation, where you have a new dad. You don't have the old dad that, that was there before. Jesus gave you a new dad, but 
Can you talk a little bit? We're, we're, I know I've had you up here for a little while, but I love seeing your face. <laughs> and you leave Tuesday, and I don't want you to go. I just want to hold. I, I just you just live with us forever. That's fine <laughs> until Jesus comes. But um, can you talk about the change from your from your eyes, your perspective? Can you talk about the change you see, not only through the addiction portion, but the change in individually? Because this is what glorifies Jesus, is when we talk about the change. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, this is our last one, right? The 18? Uh, the, the... Sorry. I feel like... You're good. Oh, how cool is my dad now? Right. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> it's not about... <laughs> It's not about Matt, it's about Jesus. I don't know why you would write how cool your dad is, but so I'll just go with it. <laughs> he's pretty he's pretty cool. Um I just am so proud of you. Um anytime someone asks about my story, like for example, we were flying here and um we sat by this guy and he asked why I was coming here. And I instantly was just, I couldn't stop talking about how proud I am of you. And, like, I would have never imagined you being a youth pastor or even a pastor in general. Um, that would be the last thing. Um, <laughs> I saw you go to jail. I saw you overdose plenty of times. Um, I saw you kind of steal from your loved ones. And I just never thought that that could change, and I think that's what made me realize that there is such a bigger power that we are completely out of control so that he could be in control. Oh, that'll preach as well. Um, <laughs> what about your mom? She's pretty cool, too. <laughs> um, no, she is... She is the... the I'm not looking over there. Um, she is the strongest woman I have ever met. Um, I just am so thankful that at a, such a young age, she never tainted my thoughts of you. She let me have my own opinion of you because it could have completely twisted and she could have said things that I would have never forgiven you for and I would have resented you my entire life. And I'm just grateful that she let me have my own opinion of you. And and she's actually the one that led you to Jesus. She is, yes. She took me to church every Sunday, um, even when you were gone. Because you, because at that time you didn't enjoy going to church. So even when you were there, you didn't really come, if I remember correctly. Um, but she was always the one that was like, we have to go to church. We have to go to church. And I was, always, I was like, no, it's too early. We're not going. But I'm, I'm grateful because if it wasn't for her strength and faith, I would have not been who I am today, I don't think. I totally agree with that. And, and as the last question that I have for you, for the, uh, the congregation, the audience, those watching online, what, what would you say to those going through something similar to what you went through or those who are holding on to any bitterness towards a child, let alone a parent? What would you say to, the, to them? Um, my, biggest, my biggest advice would be hold on to Jesus. Um, he is the only one that can transform and save lives. You are completely out of control. So you want to change your life as much as you can, but... He is, he's the only one that can take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it into good. Don't give up ever because Jesus is in the middle of your pain and suffering. He doesn't want you to stay there, but he is with you protecting you in this middle. Jesus is real. He changed our family for, and I'm forever grateful for that. And he wants you, no matter what, how much darkness you feel like you're going in, he is the light that will never go out. Uh, 
I really don't know. I don't know what to say other than if you don't know this Jesus, can I implore you, get to know him. Just get to know him. Because he is the only reason why we sit here today. He, he is the ultimate. And what's so awesome about him is even through the darkness, she just said it, he was the light that would never go out. So Crystal and Michaela always had this guide, this, this always, just this point, even if the light was dim, it was still a light that they walked towards together. And I just took a little bit longer to be able to get to that point. But I'm so grateful that Jesus is patient, that he wants, he wants all of mankind to know and accept him and to know him by name. So, Michaela, thank you for your strength and your courage, and I, I love you so much. I love you so much. Um, but can you give her a hand? Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> Nate and Sarah, you can come on up. Church, what I hope you got out of today wasn't the strength of just a sole individual, but the love of Jesus. We are a family that, that says Jesus first, everything else second. Jesus comes before our marriage. Jesus comes before my relationship with Michaela because here's how it needs to be in your lives. It needs to go Jesus, then your spouse, and then your kids. And if you have those twisted, you were going to go through hardships and pain that you weren't intended to go through. But as long as you put Jesus first, and it may look bleak, and it may look dark, and you may look at your mom or your, or your dad or your child and think, I'm never going to get them back. But as long as you focus on Jesus, I want you to know that miracles can happen. And it may not look like the way that you want it to happen, but it will look like the way that Jesus wants it to happen. And that's the ultimate goal is to have Jesus guide our lives, not for us to guide our steps and say, I'm going to do it this way. Because without him, we are nothing. But as long as you put him first and say, Jesus, let your will be done, whatever it is, come hell or high water, if you are there and you are number one, then everything else, even if it looks bad, we know that you will, you will turn that, that evil into something good. As our eyes are fixed on Jesus, it's an everyday journey, everyday walk with him as he guides our family, as he guides this church. And I pray that I just feel it, that there's some people in here right now that need to look at Jesus and they need to say, God, I'm carrying this hurt. I'm carrying this bitterness towards this individual. I'm carrying this anger. I'm carrying this betrayal. Can you take it from me? And like my daughter said, she had to do that daily. It wasn't a, a one moment of I forgive you and everything was fine. Every day she had to wake up and say, I, I need to forgive my father. Even if she didn't believe it, she would say, God, take this. I need to forgive my father. I need to forgive my father. So I want you to take that in here. I want you to get to a point where every day you're taking it to Jesus. Every day you're bringing it to God and saying, I don't feel it but I know you're real and I know that ultimate forgiveness comes through you and ultimate healing comes through you. So I need to every day bring it to, to you. And if it takes me the rest of my life to be able to forgive this person, every day I'm gonna wake up and say, God, this is yours. This is yours. This is yours. And the, the, the best thing she said is she came to a point where she realized that Jesus took it from the very beginning, but she didn't realize it that it was him that took it. The moment she opened her mouth and said, God, take this from me, he took it because that's how good of a God he is. But sometimes it takes our mind and our heart to catch up to that. So I want you to continue saying that over and over and over again. I don't forgive my daughter. I don't forgive my son. I have this bitterness towards my father. I have bitterness towards my mother. But that's not what Jesus wants for any of us. That he came to heal and to save those who are lost and to heal broken hearts. That's the Jesus that we serve and that's who I want you to be able to find healing from. 
because it is Jesus and Jesus alone. It is only the name of Jesus that will heal your family, heal your heart, and, and make a way and a place for eternity with him. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so, Lord, uh, so much, Lord, for uh, just the voice of a child that makes us realize the power of the Holy Spirit, that we don't have to get to a point in age or maturity or knowledge for us to arrive, for you to be able to use us or to speak to us, but that from an early age, the moment we say yes to you, that we're filled with the Holy Spirit that is our ultimate helper, our ultimate guide, that will bring light into the darkness. That when we say yes to you, we are given such a powerful gift, and that is a gift of an eternal home away from the darkness where we become new creations, where you form us and shape us into the people that you want us to be. And although that path may not look like what we have planned out, it is your path, and that's what really matters. And all it is is a is a cry from the heart saying, I want you, Jesus. I say yes to you, Jesus. And as I pray with all eyes closed, I always give this invitation. The Bible says that if you believe in your heart and speak with your lips that Jesus is God, Jesus is King, that I want to say yes to him, that my life doesn't have to be put together before I come to you, God. But that you, I come to you and you put my life together that I come to you broken, but all I have to do is say yes. And I feel my soul crying out that there's someone in this room that has not yet said yes to the free gift of Jesus. That it is a simple yes to him that transforms our life and gives us a place in eternity. With all eyes closed, I believe that a raising of hands is an outward declaration that solidifies what you're feeling right now inside. But I want it to be a private moment. If you want to say yes to Jesus and have the Holy Spirit enter your life, would you just shoot your hand up and raise, put it up and put it right back down? I want to pray for you. Yes, 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 yes. Any more? Any more? Jesus is with you. Yes. God, thank you so much for the hands here. Thank you so much for expanding eternity. Thank you so much for, for saving our family. And thank you so much for the families that have been saved that are in front of me because of the name of Jesus, because of the name of you. We give you all praise, all of it. In Jesus' holy name, amen.